What up, what up? Hope you guys are ready to uh, do some AP Human Drive re review. Uh, great. Last week, we finished up looking at a review of Geopolitics, Unit 4. Uh, this week, we're going to start moving into Agriculture, Unit 5. So, 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 so check it out. We are at Unit 5 of the course. All right. You guys are probably somewhere, unless you're doing like a semester-long course or something like that, you're probably in about the same area, moving through uh, unit four, you know, the political geography unit into agriculture. So we got five, unit five, six, and seven, and bam, that's it, y'all. Uh, so we are getting there. It might feel like the end will never come and you'll never see the light at the end of the, of the tunnel, but just know that uh, your course that you are currently in, human geography, is going to be over with before you know it. So um, we're going to go ahead and get started because I got a lot to share with you, and hopefully we'll have enough time to get done in an hour. So I want to give it to you. So Let's do this. Objectives. Today, we're talking about the development of agriculture, right? So you might be thinking to yourself, wow, this class, man, what the heck? We talk about population. We talk about things like maps and, and place and space and all this good stuff. We talk about culture and, and, and uh, I guess, geopolitics uh, and, and globalization. All these things kind of make sense a little bit with geography. But how the heck is agriculture going to fit into this? Well, one of the things that I didn't put in my objectives that we're going to talk about right here towards the end is all the ways that agriculture has already kind of been seen in, in the units that we've studied in the course. Okay. So it, it totally connects with literally every other unit. And that right there is the reason why we are learning about it in this class. So um, now, obviously if you guys have any questions, come down here and hit the little ask a question um, and, and I'll get to that. You can put it in the dialogue as well if you want to. But um, I just discovered that I should have been time stamping the ask a question. So if you guys go in there asking me a question, I'll take the time to answer it. And then that way we'll be able to find it later on. Let's get started. <clears throat> All right. So you can't really talk about the invention of agriculture without looking first at kind of the, I guess, I wouldn't say invention is not the right word, but the, the, the peopling of the earth. You know, how did humans live before agriculture? If it was invented, that means there's a point where agriculture started. There's a point where before agriculture started, and that's what we got to look at first. Um, humans began in Africa, all right? And, and, and so they would have used tools. They would have communicated, all right? We, we talk all the time. That's the thing that separates us from, like, dogs and other kinds of animals that only make a few different kinds of sounds or whatnot. They can't string words together to have any kind of meaning, and they're not capable of complex thought in the same way that we are. So they can't really work together in teams in the same way that we can. Plus, we are able to invent all these cool tools and things like that to help us uh, basically get the job done. So humans were pretty good pack animals, for lack of a better way to say it. We, we were really good at hunting. So um, typically, in a hunter-gatherer society, which is how human beings live for the majority of human history, uh, men would be the ones that did a lot of the hunting Women were the ones who did most of the, the gathering, and they would gather things like nuts, fruits, berries, something like that we can eat, all right? Um, this is not really because women were seen as inferior to men. Now, that's one thing that a lot of people get, mis I guess, mistaken whenever they, they study this stuff is that, oh, gender stratification has always existed. Women have always been considered less than men. It, it, it's, it's really not that, okay? In the same way that um, people in... I guess athletic team. If you if you're looking at a football team, you got your biggest people are gonna be on are gonna be linemen. Your your fast agile people that can catch are gonna be your wide receivers. The person who throws the best is gonna be the quarterback. In the same way, men typically are just gonna be a little taller, a little stronger, a little faster than women are gonna be. It makes sense that they're gonna be the ones doing the hunting. All right. Um, among other reasons. Uh, one of those reasons may be that if you have kids, women are gonna be the ones to nurse a kid every time. You know, today we have things like, thank God, formula, which uh, my both my kids use formula because we had problems with with nursing. And, and thank God we live in 2000 and, and something teen. So so we could do that. But for the majority of human history, that was not an option. And women were the ones that did nursing. So that's perhaps another reason. Uh, and men typically excel in strength. As we just said that, by the way, this word comparative advantage, I didn't just make that up. That is actually a term used in economics to refer to someone who is better at producing a good than another, say, country, another, uh, another um, economy. 
All right. In the same way, comparative advantage in this case is if men are stronger and faster and more agile and all these different things, they should be the ones that are doing the hunting because it makes sense, right? Uh, here are some examples of human beings as uh, pack animals. <laughs> That's really not the word to use, but we worked really well together and communicated very well. We could uh, basically ambush animals in, in much in the same way as you see here. Woolly mammoth uh, didn't last very long. A lot of reasons for that, perhaps, but um, there were very large animals that used to live in the in certain continents like Africa and Australia. They're not there anymore, and a lot of that's because we overhunted them because we're good at hunter, good at hunting. Um, hunter gatherers traveled in small groups, right, and they moved from place to place in cyclic patterns. Now, they weren't just randomly moving around, running all over Africa, trying to figure out, hey, well, let's just go wherever the wind takes us. No, they had there was a there was a method to the madness, all right? It's, essentially, they're going to places where they have a, an abundance of food. When they hunt the area out and all the animals are gone, they're going to go in other areas where there's going to be more animals aplenty. Now, why are they traveling in small groups? Why are hunter gatherers traveling in small groups? It actually makes a lot of sense. You can't take a pack of 150 or 200 people, you know, half of which are men hunting for animals and, and anything that's going to feed close to that many people in the plains of Africa. You can't do it. So they had to travel in small groups in order to actually be effective at hunting. It's one of those things where, like, it's great to have a team, but you have too many people on the team and everything's going to suck. I play a lot of ultimate frisbee on the weekends, guys. And uh, and, and one thing that, that, that my group doesn't do for whatever reason, I don't really know why they do this, uh, they don't like to split into different teams and they don't like to sub out like you would an actual – according to league rules. And so what happens is we end up having like in the, in the middle of the summer, we'll have 40 people show up. We'll have two teams of like 15 uh, uh, people playing. And then all it is is a bunch of people just throwing the Frisbee as far as they can across the field in hopes that someone tall and, and, and skinny will be able to jump up there and catch it. And there's really no strategy and it's not really fun. In the same way, if you've got a ton of people out there hunting, you're going to scare away all the animals. You're going to uh, never catch anything to feed your family. So what the heck? You can't have a ton of people if you're going to be living like this. Another reason for that is because babies can't move as fast as, as, as adults. In fact, honestly, I mean, even toddlers are super slow. I've got a three-year-old. I'll probably hear her screaming in there right now. And y'all, she ain't fast. Okay? So just to put that out there, babies going to slow down groups. So if they get to a new location, they have babies and, and they, they have 40 babies and you know, they can't carry them around. They can't survive. And so you might would even see, sadly enough, there's a lot of cases where perhaps in hunter gatherer societies, uh, babies would have not made it. They, they may, they may not have made it if, if they had to move to look for food. All right. So, the moral of the story is they, they weren't having a whole lot of babies. And also life expectancy would have been very, very low. But by some studies, they, they actually believe that uh, life expectancy may not have been quite as low or at least kind of neck and neck with after we became a cell society. Um, all that unit two stuff. But <clears throat> uh, another thing, could not move in search of food if children wouldn't keep up. I just said that. Also, if, if groups are large and huge amounts of food would have to be hunted and gathered. So, um you would run out of resources very, very fast. So groups were extremely small. Since groups were extremely small, they weren't having a whole lot of babies. They had to support themselves. The population really didn't grow and was extremely small. There was at one point um, uh, in, the, in the history of, of modern humans where in, in Africa, there might have been somewhere around 100,000 human beings. And that's it, all right? Uh, we got more than that and in, in a lot more than that in the state of South Carolina, which is where I'm from. Um, here's a map that shows the population of the earth over time. And you notice it, it's, you've seen this already. I mean, human beings really didn't populate that much until you got Jesus right here. I'm sorry. No, you got Jesus right here. So by the time of, of, of Jesus, uh, you've got way less than a billion people on earth. And then it creeps up a little bit throughout the maybe the Renaissance period. Uh, but then you get a just revolution and shoot, just like that. We're going to talk more about that, um, even this, even in this particular uh, uh, review. But definitely in development when we start looking at um, at uh, 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 the Industrial Re Revolution. But despite despite the fact that human populations were really low during hunter gatherer times, growing populations, the population did still grow and it still grew very regionally where people were going to be in the continent of Africa. And this would have led to uh, 
less food being available. As I said, human beings are pretty good hunters. All the large game that existed out there, like the, the woolly rhino and all these other things, like woolly mammoths and things like that, just eventually disappeared. People had to end up moving around to where you know the other continents and start to really migrate outward. And, and again, you, you may or may not have studied this in Unit 2. Um, there is actually a really good video. There's a few videos that I might continue of, but one that I know exactly what it is. If you, go, if you get a chance to go on like Amazon, um, I believe Amazon Prime is completely free. Uh, uh, I paid two bucks for it. But the first episode of the, the story of all of us, it's a, um, there we go. Uh, the transcript picked it up. The first episode of that TV show spends the first maybe 22 minutes talking about exactly this concept here. In fact, it's really a pretty good. I, I need to add that to the end of the, of the resources here in this PowerPoint. That's a really good uh, thing for you guys to watch if you get, ever get around to it. Just the first 22 minutes um, echoes a lot of what I'm saying in here. Um, hunter-gatherer lifestyles lasted about 200,000 years. Uh, but then things start changing like crazy. Actually, I probably should have looked at that. Uh, I want to say 200,000 is about right. It might be a little more, a little less. Uh, bam, the ice age is going to end. Okay, so if you look at right here, what you're looking at is 10,000 BCE to present. And now part of the reason for that is because 10,000 years is a huge amount of time. That's a stupid huge amount of time. The other reason for that is because that's about the time the Ice Age ended. And that's roughly the time that we started to discover agriculture. All right. And that brings us to the first agricultural revolution. If you guys are writing stuff down, you want to know it by two names. You want to write down the first agricultural revolution. You also want to write down Neolithic revolution. Now, you don't need to know Neolithic demographic transition or agricultural revolution or anything. Just know that when you're talking about the invention of agriculture, you're looking at the first agricultural revolution. You're looking at the Neolithic revolution. And those two words mean the same thing. Now, literally, the word Neolithic means the new Stone Age. So if you're studying like anthropology and, and, and ancient world history, the Paleolithic period is going to be the old, old Stone Age. The, the Neolithic revolution is going to, or Neolithic period refers to when people started to not move around so much. They chose to stop moving around and chose to start settling down in, in settled societies. Your earliest towns and cities started to emerge because of the Neolithic revolution, the invention of agriculture. All right. Um, <clears throat> change or oh, climate change. Okay. So, so the end of the ice age, all right, it was really icy. Now all of a sudden it's not, this is, Climate change, right? It's always been a thing. If you guys study uh, climate change or even do a simple Google search for like the history of climate change, you can see there's there's a lot of different things uh, 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 historically where the climate's going to switch. Uh, in fact, in fact, if you, if you, it, probably a better search would be a, a search of ice ages. All right, um, there's there's way more than just a couple of ice ages to happen in really really distant past. Uh, People would argue that we are still in current uh, phases of, of, um, of ice ages and things like that right now. There is one uh, ice age that happened during the or leading up to the French Revolution. So there's all kinds of different times where climate has changed simply because of having to do with really the access of the, the sunlight to the earth. OK, so I took this here from a looks like a like a little question and answer for like elementary school uh, students. But um, this here is essentially summing up what causes the kind of climate change I'm looking at here. Scientists are still working to understand what causes ice ages. One important factor is the amount of light that the Earth receives from the sun. The amount of sunlight that reaches the Earth can vary a lot, mainly due to three factors. There they are. First, how much the Earth is tilted relative to the sun. Now, I'm not sure if y'all know this, but the Earth kind of, it doesn't just rotate in a perfect, like, you know, it actually is like a top. So if you spin a top and it starts to wobble a little bit, that's what the Earth does on its axis. When it does this, the sun hits the earth in a different angle, causing there to be sometimes warmer, sometimes cooler temperatures. All right. So that's a lot of it uh, 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 right there, to be honest. Uh, uh, these other things as well kind of factor in. But and we're not talking like dramatic you know, uh, uh, changes here. So, so when we talk about the last ice age, everything was really icy all the way up until like, the mid-latitudes. When that melted and receded, that was dramatic. All right, so what we're looking at here is dramatic by, like, you know, it can affect the way we live, like it did during the leading up to the French Revolution, but it's not as dramatic as you might think when you hear about the word Ice Age. Nevertheless, when, uh, when warming occurred and ended the last Ice Age, humans had begun to inhabit and adapt in many different uh, parts of the Earth. All right, 
Um, one thing that humans do is they throw the trash away. We're trashy people. Why do you know? And so we throw stuff away in designated areas that, that we don't use, our waste material. Um, you know, th there are, uh, I mean, it's, it's very possible this right here might have led to domestication of, of dog, for one. Um, you know, some, uh, I want to say that, to say that dogs and wolves are the same, they're, they're, they're a different species. My understanding is that they can't even breed, um, but they have the same ancestry. This ancestral dog, a lot of them would have developed um, apparently, I may, may be saying this wrong. I'm not. I'm not a super expert, but just kind of like a nut, nutshell version of the story. Dogs started to uh, develop some kind of a, of a gene where they weren't so afraid of, or, or were, I guess more tolerant of people. They would po possibly rummage through trash, and this eventually would have led to uh, possible dog uh, domestication. This happened 10,000 years ago, ish. So somewhere between 10,000 and 8,000 BCE. Um, that's when you've got. Uh, the domestication of the dog occurring. This happened actually before agriculture. Um, uh, so, so just a few things I want, I want to sum up and make sure that we are on the same page on. One, the climate change that's happening today isn't the same necessarily as what I'm talking about here. Uh, when we talk about human-induced climate change, we're talking about the use of fossil fuels, releasing carbon that's been under the earth for uh, millions and millions and millions and millions of years. Now it, it's, it's being released into our air and causing a... Um, and like an atmospheric greenhouse effect. And that right there is the human-induced climate change that's in our news today. This is not the same as this, but that is, I want to make sure I, I, I made that point. The other thing that I want to say here is that um, – <laughs> well, I guess I forgot. It'll come back to me. So anyway, um, I was talking about the domestication of the dog, uh, the uh, invention. Dang, I totally lost my train of thought there. But that's okay. We'll figure it out. Um Women were probably the ones that discovered agriculture. Women were, were gatherers during hunter-gatherer societies. Okay, They're likely to notice that as weather warmed up, areas where they tossed their scraps would have possibly produced crops. Um, other things that you might well have done is uh, cut things down. Like, So if you're a kid, what kid has never grabbed a stick and run through the woods like you're playing, I don't know, some kind of a superhero with a sword and cut things down. Or even better yet, you find like some kind of a machete or something in the woods and you pick that up and go get in all kinds of crazy trouble with that, cutting things down. Well, if you go back to that area, you probably notice that a lot of the things you cut down start to grow back again. Uh, I have some trees out here in, in my yard that I cut down and I left the stump like about waist high. And every single spring, I have to go in there and cut the limbs off of it because they continue to grow. So it's not hard to understand how people will have discovered that things grow when you throw seeds in the ground and things grow when you cut them down. All right. So um, they eventually discovered that under certain circumstances, you might get better results with your crops. So uh, when it rains and the grass grows, you know, an inch in one day, they will have noticed that kind of thing too with the crops of their days. And so eventually people started experimenting a little bit, probably women. And what they would do is they would perhaps um, fence off a certain area or, or protect a certain area where a crop can grow without any kind of other uh, things getting in the way. They might take the time to water it. And they realized that they could cultivate the earth. Holy crap. Why in the world is cultivate mean? This right here is a really important word. And so is the word agriculture, right? We've already talked about culture. And one of the things that I think, I'm pretty sure I said this in one of my earlier reviews because I was at this point doing the reviews for you guys, is that when you look at the word culture, it, 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 it means um, to care for, all right? So agriculture, cultivate, and culture as in the things that we care about culturally, they all come from the same root, meaning to care for, right? So when you cultivate the earth to produce more groups, more crops, you are actually caring for the earth in a way that allows it to grow crops for you, okay? That's really important. So um, it didn't when, – when people start to cultivate the earth during the Neolithic Revolution, they started to realize that this this seemed like a good deal for them, all right? I could imagine waking up – I mean, I already hate to get up at 6.45 and get to bed at, at – uh, get to um, work at 8 o'clock and, and, and work. I mean, who wants to go to work? Not that I hate my job. I love my job. But I just would rather stay home usually. And so in the same way, if you're a hunter-gatherer, I could imagine having to wake up and go out there and hunt your food 
every single day or whatever, however often they had to do this just to survive. I mean, so the stakes are way smaller for me. Yeah, I need a job to survive, but, but if I wake up and I can't do my job, I'm going to be okay. Well, they realized you'd have to move around so much. All right, You could have surplus food. Also, this could support a larger population. So um, if I went back up there and I started looking at my, my chart that shows human population growth over time, because of Neolithic Revolution, that's the reason why ever so slightly you start to see that line perhaps go up a little bit um, towards when, when you get the birth of, of Jesus. Civilizations, a lot of civilizations had begun to flourish at that point, and populations started to increase. So this is a just a slide that I grabbed off the internet that shows a little bit of what was happening before, a little bit of what happened after Neolithic Revolution. Um, and, and, and these are the things, all right? Now, now th this one here is is debatable. Food shortages. I imagine that some people some people had food shortages. Um, over here, just because you have uh, more people growing food systematically, does not mean that you wouldn't have whole villages die out of things like famine. All right. So this happened quite a lot, um, where uh, especially if you're like looking at the Tigris and Euphrates River Valley, for example. If you guys studied more history in seventh or eighth grade or something like that. You've got a lot of people here where, where the, the, the rivers wouldn't flood right, all right? The silt wouldn't cover the, yard, the, um, the crops. You wouldn't have enough crops to feed the population. Usually, you did have food surpluses. So, so I would say that you had more food than not, but you know, uh, I don't know if you guys are going to read the, the uh, article by Jared Diamond, another resource that I need to put in here um, called the, the Worst Mistake in the History of the Human Race or something like that. Uh, it's about – agriculture being a mistake. And one of the reasons why he says this is because um, hunter-gatherers would have had a more varied diet. They ate nuts and berries and different types of root crops with all kinds of different nutrients and all kinds of access to different proteins and different things that are really good for you. They had a lot of meat from things that they hunted. So when we started systematic agriculture, one of the things you got to remember is that overwhelmingly people ate some kind of cereal crop for the majority of human history, right? Well, these are the things that are, are very carb heavy, but not very protein heavy. So basically they eat nothing but the things that today we try to stay away from if we're on a diet. Um, the result of this is that people eventually started to shrink. So hunter gatherers were built kind of like today's athletes. But you start looking at people living in cell societies, a lot of, especially the poorest of the poor, were actually very, very um, uh, 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 malnourished a lot of times because they didn't have enough variety. Their body actually shrunk so people were shorter during this time period and that much in the other but anyway the the, the the not trying to say this is not correct what i'm trying to say is that there is different there's different sides of every story right um more or less the after thing here where people uh people uh, domesticate animals and, and food surpluses and large populations those are the things that i really want you guys to take from this also specialization uh, specialization of of different types of agriculture that's that's important um the majority of people historically have been farmers, by the way, up until like in the last, I want to say maybe 2011 or 12 or something like that, about the time we hit 7 billion people on earth was also about the time, if I remember correctly, that we, for the first time, had a majority of people living in urban areas and not in rural areas globally, all right? So the majority of people up until your lifetimes were basically peasant farmers. Um, during the Neolithic Revolution, plants and animals were domesticated. All right, when we talk about domesticate, that means that they were cultivated in a way that they can be used for human consumption or whatever that might be. All right. So uh, uh, even a dog is going to be not consumed, but it's going to be something that we use for our own purpose and gain. Um, and they were used to help out with agriculture. Um, other animals, animal domestication may have started first. All right. A dog, for example, is as far back as 10 or 12,000 BCE. BCE, by, that's the other thing I was going to tell you. BCE means before the common era. CE means common era. It is the same thing. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with the, with the terminology. That's the reason why I'm saying I'm from the South. So we have always used AD, and, um, which is N.O. Domini, the year of our Lord, and B.C., which is before Christ. But this here is a more PC way of referring to the same thing. Um, agriculture first emerged in specific hearths or origins. All right. I should have a... Okay, we'll get to it in a second. I do have a map of this, okay? When I talk about hearth, what we're looking at, uh, that's a vocab word you should know by now, all right? The, the start of something or the beginning of the origin of something. Agriculture was not invented by one person, okay? It was invented by, like, a bunch of different people living in a bunch of different regions on Earth where the, uh, 
the 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 different uh, I guess what I'm trying to say different things were in line uh, uh, to make that happen characteristics or whatever you want. All right, <clears throat> this here is an example of there's a, a, a chart that shows a little bit maybe of the lineage of, of modern dogs. Very, very simplified, but it shows this idea of an ancestral dog, which is where wolves and all the different other breeds of dog that we know and love come from. Now, again, uh, biology sake, I mean, I've heard of things like, I guess there's a ton of books and stuff like White Thing and all that where dogs and wolves can, can, um, can procreate and all that, but apparently that can't happen because there are different species uh, all dogs can procreate. Wolves are not in the same as dogs. So they're, they're of the dog family. Okay, there's there's your budge lesson for the day. Um, so that brings us to this dude, Carl Sauer. Now, you may have already heard of Carl. Uh, oh, boy, Carl. All right. He is uh, the guy that your book, if you use Rubenstein's book, it is, is named after the cultural landscape, which is kind of his thing. Okay. But he also looked at origins of agriculture and, um, and, and, and determined that, that vegetative agriculture preceded seed agriculture. All right, so what that means is that originally people would have cultivated crops by essentially moving uh, your stems or roots or whatever it might be from one place to another where they were able to make the conditions more suitable for agriculture. Um, it, there's people that disagree with that, all right? So... Uh, uh, it's in the it's in the, the course description. You guys know this, uh, uh, I guess th th this stuff here. But um, so I wanted to make sure I talked about it. But just it, it's it's debatable. Um, people discovered that plants grow better with certain conditions. I just mentioned that um, they would move or cultivate those plants um, in certain areas. And one of the first areas where you would see vegetative agriculture would have been Southeast Asia, right? Where according to Carl Sauer, you will have seen things like taro. This is taro. You have seen things like yams. That right there is a yam. That's a root crop um, cultivated through vegetative planting. You also would have seen in the same region things like coconut trees and banana trees and things like that being cultivated in Southeast Asia, right, using vegetative agriculture. So I'm not asking you guys to be able to write a dissertation on this stuff. Heck, you can probably tell that I'm, I'm not the world's greatest expert at the topic of, of, the, of the ancient history and origins of agriculture. But on a, on a surface, you're going to want to know these things that I'm looking at here. Taro yams, um, bananas, coconuts, things that were, uh, that were uh, uh, diffused using, I guess, start off in the views using uh, 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 vegetative agriculture. Um, here is a map. This here comes from the Ethel Wood review book. Some of y'all might have that. And, and I just thought I'd just take a picture right out of it. Uh, talk about the diffusion of vegetative planting because it shows kind of these arrows where there's your, your I guess, your um, speculated hearth uh, of where these things originate and then where they diffuse. So you've got uh, this. Here's the Southeast Asia region I'm just talking about. You've got places in the Middle East. All right. You've got places in um, Sub-Saharan Africa uh, and in the Americas. And we're going to talk more about those places right now. This here is a map that shows a little bit more detail of the origins of certain crops. All right. So again, if you look in the same region that we're just looking at, you can see some of the examples I just gave you as well as many, many others. Now, you don't need to memorize this map and all these things, but if I were you, I'd probably know a few examples of where certain ones of these things uh, would, have, would have emerged, all right? Um, and again, you know, just don't, don't, don't memorize this whole thing. I mean, if you don't know where it is, I wouldn't take the time to, to, to learn where it, where it originated. But things like beans and and, uh, and, and and yams that I just showed you, tea, tea coffee, um, things like that, I would take the time to know where it came from. Seed agriculture. I can't believe you guys had any questions yet. Any questions for me? Feel free to ask a question. Click a little ask a question at the bottom of your screen, and we'll put it in the comments if you guys have any questions. Seed agriculture, just like it sounds, you throw seeds in the ground, they turn into crops. And again, people would have probably figured this out accidentally, as I, as I mentioned earlier. Um, today, the majority of crop of agriculture is done using seed agriculture. Cross Sauer believed that vegetative agriculture started first in Southeast Asia. I just mentioned that. Um, not all scholars just mentioned that as well. Many scholars or many people would say that agriculture would have originated in the Fertile Crescent region, which is that place right there. All right. So basic geography. If you guys don't know what you're looking at here, this is Saudi Arabia or the Arabian Peninsula. Saudi Arabia is the biggest country on the Arabian Peninsula. 
This here is where Egypt is. It's the Nile River. So you're looking at this area kind of, usually you think about it as in like the area where Mesopotamia was, but this particular map puts it all the way to the upper and, and lower Egypt, the Nile River Valley. So um, nevertheless, this area here between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, all the way along the uh, the coast of the Mediterranean Sea, that's usually what you consider the Furrow Crescent. And this here is where um, some of the earliest civilizations would have emerged and where some of the, uh, this is where most animals were domesticated. This is where um, a lot of your earliest agriculture, in particular, like uh, like uh, different types of cereal grains and things like that emerged between these two rivers. But that would systematically flood, leaving this layer of silt on the ground that people use as natural fertilizer. This is Turkey, and then over here is like um, is like Iran and all that. And this here, where Mesopotamia is, would be modern day Iraq. So in Southwest Asia, right, which is this area here where the Pearl Crescent is, barley, wheat, lentils, olives, oats, rye, overwhelmingly different types of, of, uh, of cereal grains would have been produced in mass uh, because of the, the, the um, conditions made by those rivers. Um, the most significant domesticated animals came from this area. Dogs were, were um, first domesticated here. Pigs, goats, cattle, sheep, all the different things that we still have today. Really, we haven't domesticated a heck of a lot of animals, y'all. But, the, but all the big ones, the ones that could be used the most for agriculture in terms of especially reducing labor of agriculture, emerged in this region, except for horses, which emerged uh, a little bit further up in the around the, the, Caucasus, the, the, the Caucasus region or the Eurasian steppe, the same place where Indo-Europeans began to speak. Um, all right, so also Southwest Asia is the first area where both Plant agriculture and domesticated animal agriculture, you know, plants and animals kind of going hand in hand. This is the first place where those two were kind of blended as a concept. So, again, um, there's the map. Americas are known for things like squash, peppers, maize. The most of the world calls corn maize. I know in the United States we call it corn, right? Just know it by maize when you're speaking globally. Um, potatoes, beans, cotton, and so much more. All these things over here are unique to the Americas until I'm not there yet. I'm not there yet. I need to hurry up, though. Um, the Columbia Exchange. We can get that in just a second. Old world animals, uh, pack animals, most of them originate in Europe. That's what I mean by old world. I'm going to skip a little bit because we're running out of time. This here is a, a map out of the Rubenstein book. The 10th edition is the one I have. Um, you know, I had 12th edition, but I had to give it back to school. Um, but this it's, it should be in the 12th edition as well. It's showing basically the point of origin of some of the main animals that we need to be familiar with. I would not take the time to, like I said, memorize this map, but these little things here, that's easy to memorize. I would know where these animals started. Um, okay, we're going to, all right, here we go. So this is here, this here is what I wanted to show you guys. The Columbian Exchange, write this down, super important stuff. Um, <clears throat> after the, the 1500s, after the Spanish, uh, discovered, you know, basically the Caribbean and Latin America and all that, and other countries start to go back and forth. One thing they started to do right off the bat is trade with Native Americans and and learn from them and and and, and vice versa. So, so you got to think for the first time in all the history of human beings, you've got people across the Atlantic Ocean interacting with each other. So, um, these guys over here, all the agriculture they did in, in the Americas were like usually done by human labor. They didn't have things like um, uh, mules and, and horses and things like that. So they, all those different types of animals moved over this way. Um, things like tobacco, things like sweet potatoes or any kind of potato or peppers, um, or, or a, a lot of stuff that <laughs> gives flavor to the food that we eat today comes from the Americas. Um, now, these guys did have things like certain spices and all that in Asia they used to also would flavor their food. But, but this is a huge swath of crops that these dudes never had over here. I mean, none of them. They're not in Europe, not in Africa, not in Asia, none of them. And then also things like grapes, things like bananas, oranges, other types of citrus fruit, sugar cane, holy mess. Now, if there's anything you learn in eighth grade studying U.S. history is that sugar and, and all that would have been done in plantations in the Caribbean. And oranges come from places like Florida. But they didn't until the Columbian Exchange because they didn't exist in the Americas. Uh, also, super important to know that Europeans brought over all the terrible diseases that they had largely started to at least build up a degree of tolerance to. Now, I'm not saying that people didn't die of, 
of flu and smallpox pox and um and all that. But when these diseases, in particular smallpox, moved over to the Americas, it wiped out the population. So you could talk about how guns and steel and all that kind of stuff led to the uh, to the conquest of all the Latin American societies. But ultimately, what really did it was disease. Check out this quote. No medieval force, no matter how bloodthirsty, could have ever achieved such enormous levels of genocide. Instead, Europeans were aided by a deadly secret weapon they weren't even aware they were carrying, smallpox. Come from this website here, um, Guns, Germs, and Steel, is a book written by Jared Diamond, the same guy who wrote the Worst Mistake article I just referenced. And um, that book talks about, essentially, how... Um, uh, 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 what, what it looks at, it looks at human society. It looks at um, the the question was centered on the idea of haves and have nots. So hopefully you guys get a chance to read the book. I don't have time to look at it right now. Um, globalization is is in other words, is the Columbia Exchange globalization? You could argue that even as far back as the Silk Road, uh, that was a form of globalization. But if you want to look at truly global economic interdependence, I would say that it starts during the Columbia Exchange. All right. So and, and the reason is because, again, it's truly global in this case. So modern globalization would begin during this period. Um, even though agriculture has multiple hearths and similar patterns of origin, different crops predominate in different areas. Now, here's the thing, too, about geographies. When we learn about the, uh, the, the why of where, right, the spatial perspective, things like culture and climate have a huge impact on what kinds of crops are going to be grown in what kinds of places. So. You look at climate. Certain crops don't grow so well in certain climate regions. All right, coffee, sugar, tea. These things grow in tropical climates. So, so I'm gonna show you a map in a second. Grapes, olives. These are Mediterranean crops. Um, different types of, of citrus things like that as well. Um, tobacco and cotton. You're gonna see a lot of this in warm mid latitude climates, like the southern U.S., for example. Um, culture. Some crops can be cultivated because uh, just about anywhere, but are still largely grown and consumed in their places of origin. So, for example, if you look at rice, we associate rice with Asian, Asian food or Asian uh, culture, right? They're, they, um, you don't see all the pictures of these people bent over in their little rice farms with their little hats like Raiden wears in Royal Combat. You don't see that kind of thing happening in, in, in the Americas as much as you see pictures of that happening in, in Asia. Same for corn. Man, we grow the mess out of us some corn in the United States. We feed most of it to animals. We give a lot of it to ethanol fuel, and we eat some of it here and there. But um, but dang, maize is still something that's primarily done in the United States. Here's a map that shows the regional output of cotton. Notice the latitude. Most of your cotton is done roughly in the same like latitude and the same kind of climate regions. Tobacco, again, same kind of thing. Um, coffee production, this here is a lot to look at, but just the, the point is the details. The point is the colors represent where coffee is being produced. You got different types of coffee. The yellow is Arabica coffee. The green is a mix of Arabica coffee and the other kind. And if you're drinking coffee at McDonald's or Starbucks or Dunkin' or almost anywhere where you've got actually good coffee, you're drinking Arabica beans. So, um, this is the place, these are the places where the majority of your coffee comes from. Again, they are tropical regions, places along really between the Tropic Cancer and Tropic Capricorn. Um, another example that shows you quite literally the coffee belt, uh, the bean belt between the Tropic of Cancer and Tropic Capricorn, with some of the main producers of some of our most special coffee blends that we like to consume in the developed world. That's another important thing that I want to point out to you is that notice that. If you're looking at tropical crops, they're almost overwhelmingly being produced in some of the poorest regions on Earth, but they're not to be consumed as much in these poor regions as much as they're to be consumed right here and right here and right here. Hmm. Uh, rice, same kind of thing. Maybe a little bit here in the United States. I know that it's my, I mean, there are some being produced in the U.S. I know some gets produced in my state. Uh, then you've got some rice being produced in Africa. Uh, some here, but overwhelmingly in Asia, um, along this, you know, these climate regions as well. It's got to be kind of wet. Uh, maize. This here is where the majority of the corn is being produced. China also produces a lot, and um, it looks like it goes in Mongolia as well, possibly. Um, what is this? Wheat. 
wheat, wheat, wheat being produced more or less in the same areas. Hey, by the way, another reason about wheat being produced in the United States and Europe, okay, think, think about how mechanical agriculture is in the United States and Europe. We have huge farms and tons of machines and tractors and things like that are able to harvest these things in record time compared to people in these regions where they're usually doing some form of double cropping, which means they're planting rice in the, the warm months and wheat in the colder months. All right. They're, they're doing it by hand usually. Um, okay, so subsistence and commercial agriculture. Uh, when we talk about subsistence agriculture, that's people uh, making enough food to subsist, in other words, to sustain themselves. All right, so the, for the majority of agriculture history, people have produced food for themselves and their family to consume. That's subsistence agriculture. It wasn't really until um, the, the next thing we're going to talk about, the second agriculture revolution, that you start, I'm sorry, the second, yeah, agriculture revolution, that you start seeing commercial agriculture or the uh, when people produce so much food that the purpose doesn't become any more to, to sustain their family and themselves, but to sell for profit. That's the difference between commercial and subsistence agriculture. Subsistence happens overwhelmingly in developed countries. Um, commercial agriculture, it, wait, I think I said that wrong. Um, subsistence happens overwhelmingly in developing countries. In other words, the poorest countries. And commercial agriculture happens overwhelmingly in the richest countries. All right, so which is going to be your developed countries. Now, the only exception here is that when you look at plantation agriculture, like sugar plantations and cotton plantations and tobacco plantations and things like this that you might have learned about in American history, and some of which still happens today, um, those are going to be farms that are owned usually by people that are heavily invested in or, or um, controlled by, by uh, developed countries. In other words, they're a part of commercial agriculture, but they're practiced in LDCs. Other than that, most people in LDCs are practicing some form of subsistence. Now, one more thing that I want to point out here, and sorry about my kids if you guys are hearing that. One thing that we want to make uh, make clear is that surplus crops in subsistence agriculture can be sold at market. But again, because they're making a ton of money, they're making enough to support themselves, and they're usually they, they turn around and spend it on other forms of agriculture. Uh, or, or like, you know, in the next season, for example. Okay, commercial agriculture, the focus is on cash crops. What the heck is a cash crop? Things like cotton, things like tobacco, things like corn, things like sugar, and anything they'd be used a lot really by rich countries. Now, I'm being kind of sarcastic there, but, but yeah. I mean, if you're if you're using a, a ton of cotton, you're making it into stuff to sell. Uh, I'm not saying that that doesn't happen in countries, but the, the, they're sold in, a lot of it's produced in, and then sold to developed countries. Tobacco is is really a luxury crop. Uh, you're not if you're if you're poor and you're trying to put food on the table to support your family, you're not able to literally can't afford to to, to smoke something. It's not going to really even even help to promote your life. And this is exactly you got paid to cure yourself. Um, uh, uh, a lot of the corn that we use in the country is is used to feed our animals. So that's part of the reason why we have so much corn being produced is because we have tons of animals. And hey, you know what? Do they have tons of animals in developing countries? Not as much as we do because animals are expensive. To maintain an expense to the cell, and we eat more of the meat that we that are being produced in other countries, um, and so and so uh, there's a lot of corn for that reason. I'm about to show you guys a map about that as well. Um, sugar, same thing. Croplands and pastures cover about one third of the Earth's uh, free free surface. Um, according to this study, well, if you, if you look at the map, what it's showing. I'm just going to talk about the map. What it's showing here is that. Um, in the blue areas, these are places where people produce food for themselves to eat. Um, or the majority of food is produced for people to eat. Notice that there is some yellow and red over here. That's because these are coffee-producing countries. Largely, um, they, they grow crops that they don't eat. They sell to the developed world. Now, a lot of the color that you see in Europe and the Americas is going to be like that corn we're talking about, or a lot of crops that are used as feed for livestock because we need that in order to be able to eat the beef that we or consume the beef or grow the livestock and things like that that we use to create uh, beef. By the way, um, you might not, not know this, but when you start thinking about raising livestock, um, it is incredibly, it, it, it is, is one of the, um, I, I, I don't, I'm not going to say it because I'm not 100% sure. It's, it's a huge um, um, uh, uh, 
methane methane production is is a, is a large contributor to things like climate change. Okay, if we could reduce the amount of our dependency on things like beef, for example, eat less of that, um, then then we could we could probably do it, it. It would be at least a little nudge in the right direction. Like that's what I'm trying to say. Um, commercial agriculture evolved during the Columbia Exchange, but changed dramatically during the second agricultural revolution. All right, so. We talked about the first agricultural revolution, also known as the Neolithic Revolution. Now we're looking at the second agricultural revolution, also known as just the second agricultural revolution. So almost everyone calls it that. If there's another name for it, I don't know what it is. Um, one thing you will hear people say is that it coincides with, maybe even precedes a little bit, the Industrial Revolution. And that makes sense because the main key ingredient to the second agricultural revolution is mechanization. In other words, the mechanization of agriculture. We have been able to, during this period, um, use things like the, I guess, the principles of the Industrial Revolution to greatly improve the way that we produce and are able to uh, to, uh, to, to to grow crops. All right. And we're going to talk about it and we got, we got to speed things up a little bit. I'm going to try. All right. So occur just before and concurrently with the Industrial Revolution, the period, the time period you're looking at is somewhere around the 1700, like the year 1700, up until maybe the 1850s or so. <clears throat> um, it was not something that happened overnight, but yeah, I, I will, do want to remind you, though, of the word revolution, which I think I've got up here somewhere. I guess I didn't put it in. The word revolution is, is um, you think about it as an overthrow of a country or whatnot, but more of a broad general definition of, of a revolution is simply a, um, a, a sudden drastic change in something. Okay, So yes, when you overthrow your government, that is a sudden drastic change, right? But when you think about things like the industrial and the agricultural revolutions, you're not overthrowing people. Uh, and, and we talked about how the Neolithic Revolution happened over thousands of years. So how can that be a sudden change? Well, thousands of years in the in the in the midst of hundreds of thousands of years, that's pretty sudden. In this case, you're looking at a period of about, like I said, 150 years ish, give or take. Um, and, and so when you're looking at the mechanization of agriculture or the, the second agriculture revolution, it's a little bit more than just mechanization. The first thing I want to talk about is, well, these three factors kind of help promote the movement. And the first is the enclosure movement. Super important stuff. Um, all right. So this happened first in Great Britain. Uh, and, and part of this is because all of the conditions were right. I mean, no wars had been fought on British soil. They had a sense of security. They had um, the ability to... Um, maybe experiment more without the fear of Napoleon or someone coming in and taking over their farms and, and wrecking their, their land. So things like that didn't happen as much in Great Britain, so they were able to experiment. Um, one thing that some of these richer farmers noticed is that the way they typically did agriculture was not very efficient. Here's how they did it. You would have a village and you would have common fields, and those common fields would be um, farmed by whatever peasants lived nearby them in whatever way they saw fit to do it. It's not very efficient. So what large landowners, a.k.a. rich dudes in Great Britain, started to do around the 1700s is they began to purchase large communal lands, and then they enclosed them. They put fences around them like you see today in modern farms. And when they did this, they were able to now control whatever happens within their farm. So these rich dudes started to experiment, uh, and they started to spend their money on things like um, experimenting with new kinds of ways to do fertilizer, new kinds of ways to distribute seeds, new kinds of ways to make cows uh, uh, more fat or things like this. And so, and so this here is a huge part of what the second agricultural revolution was or what caused it is that people didn't just wake up and accidentally discover new ways of innovating farming. They learned those things through experimentation. It actually is very, very scientific when you think about it. Um, the way they used to do things for so many years was this old medieval three-field system. If you guys study the Middle Ages, you probably have already studied the three-field system. And it's centered around the idea of leaving land fallow. All right, so what I mean by leaving land fallow is you simply don't grow anything on it. You're leaving it alone. You're not messing with it. So you've got wheat, barley, and then land being left fallow. Second year, you would rotate. You would move the barley here, the wheat here, and then you leave this field fallow. And so on. Well, if you're doing that, maybe maybe you're not going to exhaust the land completely over time. But dang, man, you're not using one third of your land. Well, what if you could use that last third of your land? So 
what this one guy named um, <clears throat> Townsend, Townsend is his nickname was Turnip Townsend. Um, what he did was he started to um, experiment with a four field system, and he discovered in the process that if you plant certain types of crops like turnips, that's the reason why he's called Turnip Townsend. If you um, plant turnips and other kinds of things like cloves into the earth, it will actually rejuvenate the earth and replenish it from the lost nutrients uh, from things like other types of crops. Okay, and so um, uh, I thought I had a picture of him, but that's what that's what Townsend. That's the four field system that right there by itself enables um, higher yields and also less cost in a lot of different ways. And this radically improved agriculture. Um, there is a video link at the end of the presentation. We'll show you a little bit more information about that. But basically what he did was um, you were able to use your whole your whole field, not just two thirds of it, the whole thing, um, and, and produce more food. You're able to produce food to feed your animals. And you didn't have to slaughter your animals before the end of the year because they would have enough food to eat. So it radically increase, increase the yields right there. Jethro Tull, this guy here, not the singer from like the wire several decades ago, created something we call the seed drill. Now, what this does is it allows you to make a line in which you kind of dig a hole and then plant a seed in it, which increase yields with less seeds. So again, it's a, it's a labor-saving device. It's a time-saving device. It's a money-saving device. Seeds went in the ground and produced crops. They didn't get eaten by birds and things like that. Today, that's what the seed drill looks like. So that's a modern example of it uh, due to simply as time goes on, we innovate things. Another reason why um, a, a lot of commercial agriculture is done in rich countries is because they have access to these things. The Rotherham plow made iron, uh, made, made of iron. It was kind of a triangular shape. What they would do is they would hitch a mule or something to this, or I guess two, two horses. They would hook horses to it and it would pull the plow, and it was lighter weight than the old plows they used and would eat the earth way better and made plowing way easier. Again, today, we don't do it like that. Um, the mechanical reaper, this thing on the left, um, and I don't have the person who made it up there. I, I, I should have found that. I don't even know who it was, but the mechanical reaper was invented during this time period. It enables you to, uh, to um, collect the harvest. This right here is what modern mechanical reapers look like. So... Um, so, so this right here was a time and labor saving device. This today is the reason why you see such extensive commercial agriculture going on in the Midwestern U.S. Um, replaces this kind of labor. Oh, 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 snap. I'm sorry. I meant to say that kind of labor. So, uh, and yeah, you know, I need to watch a YouTube video to find out why this guy here ends up carrying a, a, a reaper or a scythe that is used to reap. Uh, uh, wheat, but the, here's what reapers were used for, or the, the scythe is you actually used for harvesting the wheat in the same way that these things do. Could, so I couldn't imagine going out into a, into a field and doing this in order to harvest my crops, but that's what they did prior to the mechanical reaper. The cotton gin, simply, it, re, it separates the cotton from the seed and does a way better job than if you pick it by hand. So rather than have a million people try to pull seeds out of cotton by hand, you can free those people up to work on other things while wow, this machine does a better job at, at producing or getting the, the seeds separate and also does more in a day. So it's in every conceivable way a win. Um, radically improved the, uh, the way we produce cotton and the also the output of cotton we produced. Selective breeding of livestock. I could not find a chart that shows this, but over time, people were able to use selective breeding tactics to radically increase the size of things like cattle and mutton, which is a type of sheep. Um, Simply put, they chose their biggest and fattest animals, and they bred those. And if you weren't big and fat, they didn't breed you with the other animals. They let you die. And so when you breed big, fat cows and big, fat sheep and all that, then you end up getting big, fat animals. And so they were able to radically increase the amount of food that was produced by um, livestock in the same way. Now, the uh, today's agriculture, I guess, the way that we do agriculture today is an extension of this period. We are far more scientific. Our machines are way more sophisticated. We use computers in all kinds of different ways. Um, also, another thing I want to point out is that the, 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 the second agricultural revolution, the industrial revolution for that matter, primarily impacted, I guess, had the biggest impact on how agriculture is done in developed countries, in the rich countries. It affects mostly commercial agricultural output. Right? Why? Why is it that 
its impact was biggest in developing countries. It had to do with the fact that you need capital. I would write this down. Capital is some kind of money or something that you have saved up that you can use to buy the tools or buy the resources needed in order to produce your good. All right. So if you want to start a business, the first thing you need is capital. In other words, you got to go to the bank, get a big loan. So you have money to spend on your business. Same kind of thing here. In poor countries, even today, just like back then, you don't have the money to spend on the tools you need in order to practice agriculture. And so um, it builds on itself. Um, the next step was producing different types of infrastructure in order to transport things. And what do you think the Industrial Revolution did with the invention of things like railroads and steamboats? So that's all that goes hand in hand. That's the reason why developed countries are the ones that benefit the most from this. Um, now, the last thing I wanted to end on, and I told you guys I was going to end on this concept. We talked about the Second Industrial Revolution. Um, how does all this already connect to the things we've talked about in the course? You guys at this point have learned about basic geography stuff with maps and spatial perspective and the wild where. Uh, um, and, and you've learned about population geography. You've learned about culture. You've learned about geopolitics. All this intertwined with what you've done so far. First, anytime food production has increased, so has the population. If you look back at our map, I'm not going to, I'm not going to pull up the chart from the beginning of the presentation, but if you look back at that chart, um, food production increased due to more food. Of, uh, I'm sorry, population increased due to more uh, food production. The more you have, the more people you can eat. The more people are eating, the less they're starving to death, and the more that children grow up to be adults. And that's really kind of, kind of the, 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 the simple way to, to put it. Uh, people live, and so populations increase. Remember Malthus? Remember when this guy talks about how population is going to um, level out because of these natural checks due to the fact that you've got all these people um, uh, having to compete over things like limited food resources? Well, he was wrong because the second agricultural revolution changed that. We were able to produce more food, and thus the population grew even more. Sorry, Malthus. Maybe next time, buddy. Also, settled societies grew. Uh, giving way to the rise of civilization. When you have civilization, there are certain characteristics. I should have put a chart. The characteristics of civilization are centered mostly on things like um, complex institutions, like law and religion and education, things like a writing system. Okay, So a lot of these people have sat down and learned how to write for the first time, and, and that's one of the, the, the cornerstones to modern education. Things like... Uh, um, um, specialized labor. You got warriors, you have teachers, you have scribes, you have priests, you have, you know, the list goes on. Um, different types of, of buildings and, 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 and cities and, and, and things like this. And, and these are all parts of the elements of civilization that led to modern day culture. So all of these things happen because of agriculture. Um, I've only got like another minute or two, y'all. I promise I'll let you go. The development of agriculture is also interwoven with early units because, um, of second, the class divisions. Uh, uh, you could argue, and Jared Diamond argues very well in his in his um, article I referenced about the worst mistake in the hu human history, uh, the idea that class divisions happen because during hunter-gatherer societies, they were, there were no haves and have-nots. Okay, uh, Everyone worked for the collective good of the group or else everyone died. Today, or I guess as soon as agriculture emerged, you start seeing some people who have more wealth than others, and they use that wealth which was equivalent to power. I mean, these, these people become kings and nobility and all this kind of stuff that in some ways have, have um, really, uh, I guess, caused the direction of human history, but also in so many ways uh, have, have caused lots of problems for human history. So if you study the aristocracy, a lot of times they had the same characteristics as some of the hunter-gatherers in terms of their height and health, but the poorest of the poor didn't benefit as much from that. Um, so the idea of haves and have-nots. Gender roles. Um, Women's status declined because of agriculture as men took the lead in most areas of these early societies. So women, men went from being uh, the hunters and stuff to being the new chieftains, the leaders and, and all this. And honestly, a lot of that probably is because you know, they're not going to, again, they're not going to be able to take care of kids in the same way that women can. Um, and so I guess it was easy for men to take power in ways that kind of subjugate women for most of of, of human history. And so we're, we're still, we're still trying to pick up the pieces of that disaster. Number three, globalization, globalization and diffusion of this, of, of, and, dis, and distribution of agriculture. These are all having to do with the spatial perspective, the why of where 
climate, culture. We just talked about these things being some of the reasons for why agriculture is where it is. All right. That's that's unit one. That's the stuff we've already talked about. Contagious relocation, hierarchical diffusion. You see where um, the diffusion of agriculture itself was through contagious diffusion, through hierarchical diffusion. I'm sorry, through um, uh, relocation with the Columbia Exchange. All right. All these things show up. Different types of, of places, like for example, in Walmart, uh, uh, flowers from there probably come from the Caribbean. They probably come from other countries. Um, Florida produces mostly oranges. We California produces huge amounts of the milk. Great Lakes with the cheese. All right, coffee. If you drink that, it comes from other parts of the world, not the country that you grew up in. So, in summary, this that's it. In summary, the um, I do have some uh, at least one video I want to show you on the next slide. Neolithic Revolution is also known as Agricultural Revolution. It occurred thousands of years over the course of thousands of years in multiple places. The Columbia Exchange is the beginning of global trade. Um, the second agricultural revolution is the mechanization of agriculture and so much more that led to higher yields and higher populations simultaneously. And agriculture can be seen in all facets of human geography. Mind blown, right? All right. So there is the video resource. If you Google, I'm sorry, if you go on YouTube, you type in cause of the industrial revolution, you'll get directly to the video that's linked there. It's a really cool, quick, summary of some of the agricultural changes that happened leading up to the industrial revolution. So I wanted to leave that with you. Um, when I do the resources for this, if you guys are on the Fiber Bible Plus, you have access to, to um, I will try to find a link to the Jared Diamond article. And um, also I'll reference in there that Amazon Prime video that I mentioned. So that's all I got for you. Any questions for me? Thank you all so much for being here with me tonight. Um, again, tell your friends about it. If it's helpful at all, tell your teacher to come up here and you want to chat with them in the side while I'm talking about these AP Human Geography things. Um, next week, we continue in agriculture. Hope you guys have an awesome night. Peace out.